Hello and welcome to The Last Wicket, a cricket podcast that is probably the only thing that can calm an angry Rahul Dravid. I'm your host, Benny, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mayank. Hey, everyone. Nish. Hello, everyone. And him and Nish. Hello, everyone. And this week, we will be speaking with cricket analyst Dan Weston. We talked to him about his journey in analytics, T20 recruiting strategies, challenges inherent to cricket data, future of analytics and cricket, and much, much more. But first, the IPL is here and it is off and running. Uh, at, at the time of recording this episode, we are three, uh, three games in. And uh, I just want to check in with uh, the rest of the last cricket team about what really stood out for them. Uh, I want to go with Nish. Uh, what has stood out for you the, from the first three games of the tournament? You know the IPL is back in town when we already start complaining about ABW is not getting to face enough deliveries. So that's like a real indicator that the bandwagon is back in town. I um, think he had my... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, turns out it ha- he had. My top three picks would be, um, I would start with today's game actually, which is more fresh in memory. And um, Sunrisers, Hyderabad, they punched about their weight, but they didn't have kind of enough, enough firepower in the middle order. And... Some of the performances were, you know, some of the decision-making was questionable and you could see the rust in their side. But if I were to like point my finger at a performance that stood out was one was uh, Andre Russell's death bowling, which was pretty um, on point from around the wicket. He kind of like choked Manish Pandey, who spent a lot of deliveries without really gaining any momentum or going anywhere. Uh, and then another play or a strategy that kind of like didn't work out for um, SRH was not promoting Adil Samad above Vijay Shankar. Um, given Samad's, you know, explosive strike rate last year, I thought it would have been a pretty straightforward decision, but for some reason they went with their uh, strategy of sending Shankar and it didn't pay off. And it might have not paid off as well, but, you know, Samad did show some real glimpses of how easy, uh, easily he was able to put away uh, comments. That was from today's game, and um, already it's, these games are like merging into one another and it's becoming a blur, which tends to happen with IPL quite often. Uh, but from the CSK this game, I think the positives, you know, outside of the loss was Raina's return and his aggressive um, batting from a CSK perspective, which was very encouraging to see. And as a CSK fan, you know, it kind of like, points the finger or puts the focus on what we missed last year. And then from Delhi's perspective, I have to, you know, everybody knows Pritvi Shaw and Shikhar Dhawan's potential and they delivered on that potential. But Avesh Khan, you know, fulfilling his faith, uh, fulfilling the faith, uh, fulfilling the trust placed, placed in him, uh, produced a remarkable performance when other bowlers were going at 9, 10 and over. So, yeah, it was good to see. I think... The first game, obviously, AB the World Years is just another AB the World Years show. Everything else was just, you know, on the peripherals, kind of like uh, didn't really grab my attention much. Yeah, good start to the season. You know, about uh, Vijay Shankar coming ahead of Abdul Samad, um, I saw that uh, Trevor Bayless, the Sunrisers coach, he mentioned that uh, Vijay Shankar had been hitting the ball really well in the nets. And that's why uh, we sent him about, about Samad. I can kind of see the argument both ways because I feel like something similar was mentioned about Rahul Tewatia last year. And, you know, he had been really practicing his six hitting and it kind of paid off big time, you know, in uh, against the game, uh, against Kings 11 Punjab last year. So I get it because I, I think Vijay Shankar scored like 95 in a practice game like a few days ago. And I think that's based off what they went. Like, oh, he's in form. He's in good touch. Let's kind of send him up. I think it backfired, um, but I think going forward, they'll they'll probably stick with some of the head of Shankar. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, you know what, if Trevor Bayless says that, then obviously he knows more than I do sitting miles away from the, you know, the strategy room. But, you know, from a fan's perspective, uh, it didn't feel like, you know, they felt, it, it felt like they left something out there in terms of strategy. But, hey, you know, it's only game one and there's a long way to go. Right. Let's see how it pans out for yeah. Early days, early days in the IPL. Yep. So we have to cut some slack for all these uh, players Great. and coaches. Um, Mike, what, what stood out for you? Um, so talking about early days, I think the first game, a couple of things stood out for me. One was RCB going with Washington Sundar as an opener. Now, I think it's pretty clear that um, it, was, it was partly due to their you know regular preferred opener, Padikal being still in quarantine and recovering from covid but um, I feel like there's a mixed emotion amongst fans for Sundar as a batsman. 
And we've obviously seen him perform well in tests. So if you want to see him do well in IPL, I personally think he's a really good batsman. He's not the best stroke maker, which is why I wouldn't necessarily want to see him again at the top. Um, but again, he was just a replacement for one game until a uh, regular opener is back. So I think it was worth a try. Um, the other thing that stood out for me was, am I going with the unknown left armor, uh, Jansen? And, um, you know, there was a lot said about that and him going over somebody like Adam Milne or, um, you know, all the other options that Mumbai have. And it, I think Clive wrote a really good piece about that game. And he talked about how um, Mumbai have this habit of doing these experiments in the beginning, which really makes sense because it's a 14 game league. Uh, trying out various combinations in the first three to four games makes a lot of sense. And, um, uh, you know, they, he didn't necessarily have a poor return. He, he still did reasonably well. And the fact of the matter is Mumbai is such a strong side that they can always, you know, take these one-off experiments and still manage with the uh, core group that they have. So overall, those two things stood out. I think both tactically, you know, um, may not have worked as well as they would have hoped, but um, it, it makes sense. Like, I think this is the, the place to try, especially with, a World Cup coming up, especially with long IPLs coming up. Yeah, Washington Sundar is actually a very good batsman, as we have seen in the test matches. I think in the TNPL too, he has opened and has scored some, you know, big runs. I wonder if that was like the reasoning, of, you know, since this was always going to be, I'm assuming, a short-term kind of uh, idea, just to test him and see how he's going to do in the opening slot if they needed like a backup or reserve option. Um, I It's never struck me that Washington Sundar is your typical T20 opener. When you look at guys like David Warner um, or any any other big hitting opener. Johnny Bersto. Yeah. Sundar is more of a classical batsman, right? Like he, he likes to time his strokes. He likes to take his time a little bit. Um, so yeah, it felt a little out of place, but again, kind of similar to Mumbai Indians approach. I think RCB or any other team can aff- afford to try out these experiments at the beginning of the tournament rather than do it at a crucial juncture, but which I'm not ruling out from RCB <laughs> to try this at a very crucial juncture as well. Yeah, the one thing about Sundar I was going to mention is I think age also plays a part because if you think about it, um, not just in the IPL, but in T20 leagues around the world, there's probably two or three really good T20 openers that are that young, that are in their early 20s or, you know, in their late teens. Um, Because I think hitting capability, while it comes naturally to some youngsters like Abdul Samad, um, it doesn't necessarily come as naturally to others. And that's why I think in the IPL, I can only really think of Ishan Kishan as being a successful young opener. Uh, Pretty much everybody else has, you know, that aspect of, having the basic technique and then combining it with some limited stroke play. Right. Uh, speaking of big hitting, you know, for me, the standout and it's always going to be CSK uh, for, as a fan who has kind of grown used to and just accepted that CSK is never going to be the kind of team that's going to race to a hundred for no loss in like eight overs. Uh, we'll just take if they can score at seven or a, at least eight runs uh, per over uh, in, in the first half of the innings. It was nice to see that, you know, they just seem to be more proactive um, in their in their game against uh, Delhi. Uh, they kind of started out like just like the, the usual CSK. They're kind of going around six runs per over during the power play. Uh, but then Raina, uh, Raina got going and then we had... Sam Curran hitting some uh, big shots in the middle, Moin Ali coming in and giving him Perez. So it was refreshing to see. And I think they could afford to because, you know, as we saw, we had Shardul Thakur at 10 and Deepak Chahar at 11. So they they could they could really bat deep. And I think it gave them the freedom to, you know, just go out and not worry about who's going to come next. So it was, it was refreshing to see. And obviously the result did not end in uh, CSK's favor, but... Uh, I hope they stick with this approach for the remainder of their campaign because if they continue to do this, you know, there's going to be some games where CSK's bowl is done up. So we'll win a few games here and there. So that's my big hope. Yeah, talking about CSK, um, I think whenever they've done well, they've had um, attacking openers at the top and they've had um, 
a good pacer right so dark bolinger in 2010 and 11 uh, lungi nagedi was a, a big uh, contributor to their win in 2018 as well and if you remember they've always had this formula of having an overseas hope so it was matthew hayden plus murli vijay then it was mccallum plus dwayne smith so they've always had attacking openers now the problem with them is that uh, being conservative in the power play works at chepok yeah. but at the vankhede with the kind of bowling attack they have they need 220 every game to have a chance and you can't make t- that score if you have even one phase of conservative batting and i think their problem lies there they have to get uthappa back in because he is in rollicking form and they have to do something about faf duplessy because he's not been doing well over the past one and a half two seasons for them. so they have to do something about that because they've decided to make a deep batting order which means you have shardul at 9 or 10 or whatever but if you don't capitalize on the power play it doesn't matter right, right. because it all adds up in the end the second thing they've got to do is Berendorf has to come in. He's still playing a shield game. I think he'll come in after the third game. So he has to come there because uh, they have to have some sort of enforcer in the power play. And you know, T20 batting is a conditioned response. So if you have a left armor bowling swing in the power play, it's always useful. And taking wickets up front is always useful. So they have to have some sort of a skillful bowler bowling in the power play. You know, Deepak Chahar just doesn't cut it anymore because... I don't know why he was successful he was curling the ball a little bit in the first two seasons he played but now he's just bowling too many wayward balls and at his pace at the Vankhede it's just not working like it won't work and they have to do something about that because they leak too many runs in the power play and then they don't have spinners who are good enough to capitalize especially on that flat surface in Mumbai so they have a bunch of problems uh, with them which they have to look at they should stick with Moin Ali at 4 he has been known to be a spin uh, basher in the middle overs i think ben jones wrote an article about 2 years ago about this uh, and he should stay there and bash spin in the middle overs along with rena i don't know what they'll do with dhoni i don't know where they can hide him he obviously won't drop himself but he needs to do something about his batting because it is clearly out of touch he's clearly mistiming the ball uh, and i don't know what role he plays in that batting order because if he comes in the 18th over in the 19th over he can't hit anymore right. and you can't have a position where he comes and you know plods around and takes 10 balls to get in that doesn't work anymore so csk are kind of you know they they have this concept of loyalty and uh, they're playing a brand of cricket which is i think 3 or 4 years too outdated and it's finally catching up with them because the bodies that were working for them in 2018 and worked for them are also sluggish all these players haven't played cricket right Bravo plays some cricket, but he's kind of waning now. He's not that useful. Deepak Chahar has gone off the boil. Lungi Nagidi has lost his form. Dhoni, I don't know what he does. He's not played any cricket since I don't know when. So the cogs that were working for him, them aren't working anymore now. And that that brand of you know playing the game is showing up in their faces basically because it doesn't work anymore. So they have to be a little proactive with that. And Dhoni is a little rigid. in the kind of teams he picks he doesn't change very often he has to sort of be a little more proactive with that and listening to both of you talk about how deep they bat um it's it almost feels like they're trying to do what england do in t20 cricket except that they don't have the batting for it um <laughs> so i find that quite funny especially because i'm co-hosting the pod- podcast with three csk fans who <laughs> it almost feels like are supporting a 90s india team <laughs> trying not to show any bias uh well they have two english batsmen so i guess that's uh you know that's the idea fill fill the side with enough english players and they might just you know rub off with their big hitting uh but speaking of the ipl we want to hear from you our loyal listeners uh you may have noticed on your podcast apps that there is an option to leave a voice message for us so over the course of this tournament we want to hear from you about any passage of play that you think is worth talking about It could be a strategic uh, master stroke, a brace of wickets, or a short cameo. Just let us know, and we might just feature your message on the next episode. Our guest for the next two weeks is Dan Weston, who is a cricket analyst who provides strategy and recruitment assistance to teams through his firm Sports Analytics Advantage, which he started in 2017. He currently works with Leicestershire County Cricket Club and also the Birmingham Phoenix side in the upcoming 100 competition. 
He's also authored a book, Strategies for Success in the Indian Premier League. And this week, we feature the first of a two-part conversation we had with Dan about T20 recruiting and strategies in the modern era. All right, so Dan, uh, why don't you tell us a bit about how you got started with analytics and you know how your journey has been so far? Yeah, sure. So I've always been like really maths orientated and very you know, just a fan of sport. It's full stop. Any sport I, I love, whether it's football, cricket, tennis, anything, I'll, I'll watch it. I'll watch everything from when I was young. I played everything. I just but yeah. and then you realise you're kind of not ever going to be a professional sports player, which I guess is a lot of kids' dreams at some point. Um, and I, from about the age of about eight or nine, I started getting fascinated with simulating matches and getting the averages out of the weekend newspapers and stuff. They did like a, a supplement. They used to have a sports supplement and pull out for the averages for county cricket in England. And I used to simulate matches from that and have tried to build in like a random element, which was, I guess, pretty advanced at the age of about eight or nine years old. But I managed to do it and... and kind of 30 odd years later I've managed to to build a career in that so that that was that was superb um I got a degree in accounting and finance so again quite maths orientated as well and um from there on I I, I worked in the gambling industry quite significantly so I did things as well like play online poker full-time um which which was pretty big back back in the day particularly uh around about mid 2000s was huge um so so again and again that's maths orientated again it's a lot of game theory and I feel that actually the, the the learnings that I had from from getting to a pretty competent level playing online poker have actually really helped me with with the cricket analytics side of things as well so I, I got to deal with the the kind of thing that a lot of people struggle with which is making bad decisions and losing or making so yeah, making bad decisions and winning or making good decisions and losing, which happens quite a lot. We see in cricket matches a lot, you know, there's always that element of variance involved. And and, and that and poker taught me that really well. And it also taught me a lot about sample sizes as well. So I think we might talk about sample sizes in a bit in, in, in the podcast. But to look at a kind of your level of profitability or expected profitability at a certain level, you would have to play about 30,000 hands, which sounds a lot, but if you're multi-tabling online, it's about two weeks' work. Um, you play about six hours a day kind of thing. Um, now, 30,000 hands is obviously a lot different. You're not going to get that sample size for in cricket at all in terms of, like, you know, uh, batsman versus leg spin or something like that. No one, no one faces 30,000 balls of leg spin. But I think it kind of tells you a little bit about how cautious you have to be in terms of treating drawing conclusions from very small data sets and a lot of the time you see people on twitter they'll be like oh uh vera coley scored 50 from 40 balls against x bowler and he's been dismissed four times so it's a good matchup well actually it's we don't know if that's a good matchup because right. you've got to be able to quantify the likelihood of of that match th- those numbers replicating themselves over the, the next 50 balls and because the sample size is so small we don't know if that's going to be going to happen with any certainty at all so all it really is is like a soundbite and a bit of clickbait I think really rather than a, anything with decent predictive value and the other thing I, I, I learned a lot from poker as well was a lot, a lot of a lot of game theory stuff and also taking different approaches in certain circumstances against people that you play regularly. So they call that meta game. So in that situation, you might take like a non-standard line against someone who you've played against a lot in the past because you have to mix it up against them so that you're not predictable. And I think that we you can see that a lot in, in cricket as well with, with matchups, as, uh, bring, bringing that side of into into the argument as well so you wouldn't want to do the same thing against the same player all the time because they're going to expect it so you might have to take a non-standard line on occasion maybe even a line which has in isolation some negative expected value to get future positive expected value down the line hi dan thank you for joining us today um let's dive right into the ipl portion of it um this is a three-part question so bear with me here um what is your view on ipl building IPL team building in general. The second part are teams recruiting and constructing their teams in a suboptimal fashion. And the final part of it, which teams based on their current squad 
can and where can they improve if at all they can? Yeah, okay, so, so that's a great question. I've written about this kind of thing quite a lot in the past, so I feel like I'm quite well well positioned to, to try and answer this question. I, I've watched probably in the last four years 90% of the drafts and auctions around the world, so so something that I've put a lot of time into and studied as well, um, historical dynamics of different leagues, things like that. I... I am not massively convinced about a lot of the IPL team building. Certainly a team like Mumbai Indians will do it a lot better, I think, than 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 most. But I think that they're probably the outlier in my opinion, as opposed to to you know a standard standard thing. Um so some of the issues that I think that, that manifest themselves with IPL recruitment and also not just IPL recruitment, but recruitment in any franchise league around the world pretty much is one thing is the recency bias. So what we see a lot of the time is that Australian players are, are over-prioritised in the IPL. And I think that coincides a lot of the time with the, the timing of the Big Bash and around the IPL auction. The fact that the Big Bash is a very well-marketed competition as well with a great visibility. You can see every match on TV probably around the world. And, and timing is good. And I also think we saw that a little bit with, I think West Indies played India twice, just be- two years in a row, just before the auction in T20 internationals and we saw quite a few West Indies players getting picked up for big money as well and I have no doubt that that it had the auction been after the uh, IPL sorry the auction was if the auction was after the England v India uh, ODI and T20 series players like Mark Wood probably would have gone for like 10 crore or something like that because of that recency bias as well so that's something that I think is a big problem and and i when I'm looking at players' data, I, I won't look at stuff like that. It's weighted in, of course, but I'm looking at, like, say, like a two or three year performance output as opposed to two or three months, you know, or two or three matches. I, 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 I try and be a lot more thorough in, in terms of the, the data sample size. And is I think that two, two to three years, depending on the volume of matches played, is kind of the sweet spot between recency and a fairly robust sample size. I certainly wouldn't want to go that far much further back because then you start maybe losing uh, a view on whether a player's declined or whether there's some dramatic improvement in a player's ability, particularly for young players as well. And, and moving on to that sort of age dynamic as well, I think that there's a lack of understanding from a lot of IPL teams of, of the kind of age dynamics and age decline. So, I mean, I'm sure the that it won't surprise a lot of listeners to know that, that CSK are the oldest team in the IPL by, by quite some distance. They also spend, if you're looking at it from a core perspective, considerably more than any other franchise on players age 34 or older as well. So the question is, like we, they've talk, talked about the overhaul needed for CSK for quite a long time now. And I think that that will, personally, I would have probably done a little bit more before the mini auction. But obviously, before the major auction next year, it will it will manifest itself. Surely, that there's going to be that big overhaul because it has to be. But you have to anticipate that decline better. So, I'll give you an example in in England, football's huge, and Sergio Aguero, who's probably been one of the best players in the Premier League over the last decade, um, he was re- he's been announced that he's leaving Manchester City at age 32, and and football teams are really getting a lot better at. Uh, dispensing of the legend players when when it's perhaps more cost effective for them to to release them rather than rather than keep them on at a higher salary but with reduced performance out i i feel that ipl teams sometimes struggle to get their heads around that a little bit and you often see players on perhaps 10 plus court crawl ipl deals who are clearly in decline and clearly not the player that they used to be, but because of their reputation or status or marketing value or, or maybe all three of those kind of things, uh, they're still they're still paid those amounts of money. And I think that if you if you're gonna go toe to toe with teams like the Mumbai Indians who recruit really well, then you have to take that emotion out of the decision making process. As opposed, to, you've got to be completely rational, be a bit more, you know cold-hearted if you like in terms of not 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 letting that emotion and the player's name get influence that decision making i also think that the the few of the teams who struggle have spent too much on overseas players so i look at the overseas and domestic dynamic a little bit differently as well so if you look at mi they don't tend to spend that much on on overseas compared compared to a lot of the other franchises and I look at it, so you've got to pay seven, seven, obviously, four overseas. So the, the locals are like 
I look at it as a cake. So the, the locals are the base and then the overseas are the icing. But you can't make a cake without the base. And you can't make a successful T20 team without good local players. And I think some, some teams have got their priorities, I think, a little bit mixed up in that, that area. And that they're, they're, they, will, they will happily spend 60% of their budget on overseas players and then get questionable quality locals to come. So they have that kind of Galactico approach, but but it's it's quite flawed, I think, you know. Um other other areas that I think they can improve is the squad, the squad balances as well, and and understanding what creates a driver for success. Because you you, you have to win the boundary percentage count in matches on a very regular basis for to succeed in competitions. Um, MI last year, for example, they won the tournament, but they had the highest net boundary percentage that I've seen in a competition for a long time. And when I say net boundary percentage, I mean boundary percentage scored over the tournament. Versus minus boundary percentage conceded. So I think theirs was about three and a half percent, which is just gigantic for, for a T20. Um, it's very, very rare for a team who are the markedly negative bound, uh, net boundary percentage, certainly worse than minus one to qualify in comps. Uh, and if they do, they're almost always bowling orientated. So their bowling attack gets them out of a lot of trouble. And it, it, on that point, it's, it's very, very difficult to win a tournament or get to the latter stages and where you know and and i think that's a lot of the time that should be the target top four and then if you're 60 40 in subsequent matches then you're doing really well um they you have to have a good bowling attack and i think a lot of teams they go still go too top heavy on batters and then they they lack particularly death bowlers and i think that maybe the rcb squad is a good example of that right now. Obviously, they won today, but I don't expect Harshal Patel to be able to be that that hero in the death, uh, you know, throughout the tournament. Um, so that's 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 the issue. Understanding what you need to build in terms of that squad dynamic is critical. And I like I like certain other things. Like I like uh, batters who bowl spin in the top six. So if you've got two batters in the top six, you bowl spin, uh, then you've got you're opening yourself up to a lot of matchup uh, possibilities as well. If 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 you you get to a venue and you you in the you start the match off and you find that it's turning, then you can go you can go flexible and you can maybe bowl twelve to fifteen overs of spin if you want to. If you've got those batters in your in your batting group, you can bowl a bit of spin as well. And so, for example. I'm working with Birmingham Phoenix for the hundreds, so we've got players like Moeen Ali and Liam Livingston who can do that out of our, out of our top six batsmen. So, so I think that that's that's kind of a good plan as well in terms of that squad building thing. Um, and I mean, when I'm doing recruiting, particularly like county recruitment, one of the areas that I think is massively key is gap analysis. So, picking area, p- picking players in pre-identified areas that you need to improve as a group. So finding areas where you're weak at and then finding players to plug those holes. So what I did before the auction was that I went through all of the the squad data for each team. And I also went through phase data, pace versus spin data. So I felt like I had a pretty accurate handle on where where teams need to invest in the auction to to plug those gaps but not a lot of teams really did it so for example i really felt that csk needed an aggressive opener now it may well be that they use moeen ali as something, but you could also argue that he'd be perfect as a spin hitter in the middle order as well so but then then when they lost josh hazelwood i thought alex hales would be a really good replacement because they needed that extra extra opening option but they ended up getting Jason Berendorf instead, who, and I think when, when you've got him and Rahul Chahar in the same team, they're, they're, they're going to have to try and bowl six power playovers between them, and it, maybe there's a little bit of a lack of variety. So I didn't feel that Berendorf was was particularly needed. And, and again, it's that gap analysis that I found that CSK have been weak in, in the power play batting in terms of intent, and I thought that a Hales-type player, it didn't have to be Hales. It, so, uh, someone really left field like Raman Aluka Bars would have been a really nice pickup as well, I think. I think he's someone who's got massive potential too. But And, and, and likewise with SRH, they, they did get that opening batsman from overseas as a replacement player, but I think they needed like a lower order hitter instead. So yeah, a bit of maybe someone someone who bowls a couple of overs and, and bats at say six is a good finisher. And um, so so there's I'm not sure that these teams necessarily look at the skill set that they need, particularly in these short term replacements as well. And and if if I was working for an IPL team, which hopefully I, I would like to do at some point, I would have kind of covers for all players 
after the auction, I would work out who the replacement players would ideally be if we needed to replace a, uh, one of our better players in, in, in the comp before it starts. I want, especially one of the overseas players that you've got, you've got your pick of a lot of players at that point, particularly if the, the player you put out, for example, like Mitch Marshall and Hazelwood was saying, was it too cross? So you have your pick of everyone who's unsold. So you, you would you would want to prepare about that, I think, in, in advance. And as, soon, as soon as you have a player who's pulled out, you go straight to that that option that you've drawn up in advance. And I, I don't think teams do that, to, to be honest with you. You know, on the same note, you uh, recently ran this Twitter poll, right? With Virat yeah. Kohli numbers. Mm-hmm. And to show that, you know, the name matters more than the game in terms of IPL selection. Why don't you talk about that? Because that's a problem in Indian cricket, yeah. right? I think it's a problem around the world. I don't think it's necessarily isolated towards Indian cricket. I think it's a, very much the same in England as well, in that, that the name is is huge. So, and this is what I wanted to try and prove for, via that Twitter poll, uh, in terms of if, if a player is just called player X in an auction or a draft list, would they actually get sold? And I've had this conversation with coaches before, because one player that I mentioned in the conversation with coaches, who what I didn't mention in the polls was, was Steve Smith. Because I said, if, if Steve Smith was an overseas player, who, but you didn't know who he was, no one would sign him, because numbers are unspectacular, right? Whereas... Whereas because he's one of the greatest current players in Test cricket right now, I don't think anyone would debate that, he gets contracts. And, and, and if you treat his T20 data in isolation, you wouldn't sign him if you didn't know who he was. So I think that the, that that perception obviously does skew that recruitment side of things. And the polls showed that as well. When you, you put the data from Virat Kohli, Ben Stokes and Raman and the uh, but no one knows who they are. And people thought that Raman and Gabaz would get a better contract than Virat Kohli and Ben Stokes. And I think that proves everything that you need to know in terms of that, that perception and versus actual performance output. And, and I feel that sometimes when you do that, it surprises a lot of people as well, because I think in England, Ben Stokes has got this, this reputation of being this big hitter, aggressive batsman. But actually in T20, we don't see it that often. And... I think it sounds strange to say this, but I think it's very true in that actually the longer formats suit him more than T20 and the numbers bear that out. Yeah, he's getting massive contracts at the IPL and, and yeah, he's a scarce resource. I think was a kind of a, an all rounder, but whether he qu- quite justifies the price that he does go for in auctions is, is perhaps another matter entirely. Yeah. So, you know, the, um, the predictive power of data, right? I've, yeah, I've always been a sort of, a skeptic, mm. skeptic of that because to use lower level numbers to pick players for higher level leagues uh-huh. has to be challenging, right? Because there's so much variability and the level is so different. So how do you get around that? Yeah, uh, well, it's interesting. Yeah, you say that because we could have also probably added that into the mistakes that the IPL teams make as well is that they don't very, they don't judge very well the difference in standard between one league and another. So a good example would be the Big Bash. I think the Big Bash has declined in quality over the last couple of years, two or three years. Very rarely do you see Australian international current players playing in that tournament. You get injuries and suddenly that great cricketers get called up for the for the tournament. And I, I don't think it's as high a standard as perhaps it was a few, few years back, but you still get the Australian players playing IPL. And the same as in Indian domestic cricket as well. Sometimes you see teams paying like five plus crore for a player who's played like Tamil Nadu Premier League and not even played Saeed Mushtaq Ali trophy at that point. And, and I don't think that they're, they're very cognizant of the difference in ability or difference in standard, I should say, the difference in difficulty level between between those competitions. So I look at the Indian domestic pyramid as like, if you compare it to football, the IPL will be the Premier League, Saeed Mushtaq Ali will be the English Championship, and then Tamil Nadu and Karnataka Premier Leagues will be like League One or something like that. And you don't really ever see Premier League teams taking a chance on League One players, and you, unless they're extremely young and they're cheap. You very rarely do you see a Premier League team play like pay like 10 million or more for a player in League One because it just doesn't really happen. But you do see the equivalent in the IPL, if that makes sense. So that 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 understanding that difference in standards is huge. So what I do in terms of that is is I try to build a bit of uh, a, what I call I consider to be a USP for, for for me as an analyst. In that I wanted to understand the difference in standard dynamics between each league. So for example, in what I can do is I can look at, I can cross-reference all the players who have played certain multiple competitions in the past and then look at like an average decrease or increase of standard 
based on that. It's not perfect, but it actually works pretty well as a, as a broad guide, as a general rule of thumb. Uh, and, and there's other things as well. So for example, the, if you have a high strike rate, which is always a high boundary percentage in, in a lower level competition, usually you can maintain that intent at a higher level tournament as well, because intent is only really derived from one mentality and two power usually both right and you if you you will still have that at the higher level but you just get out a lot more often and that's where the the standard of difference in standard is reflected in the the dismissal rate as opposed to the strike rate so so understand those dynamics as well so for example in in english second 11 cricket for example you, you see players who hit like 170 plus in second 11 cricket someone like ed pollock would be a really good example he's a really aggressive opener and and in in when he plays first team for for Warwickshire, he still strikes at 170. He has like pretty much just the highest strike rate every year, or over like a two or three year period, he'll have the highest strike rate. But he has like eight or nine balls per dismissal. So he that's the difference in standard is reflected by the getting him just getting out more often than he would do in the second eleven level. So understand those dynamics is really useful as well. So but the thing is, based on the kind of say from TNPL to IPL. Based on the adjustment factors that, that I found were the average adjustment factor, there are very, very, very few players who would be above average in the IPL based solely on MT and MPL. So I often think that it's quite a big mistake for IPL teams to invest too much in players who are unproven, at least at SMA level. We sort of saw that with Varun Chakravarti in his first season. Yeah. I think he got picked from a TNPL side and then he didn't matches for Punjab. Yeah. Yeah. So it's always a challenge to do that, right? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. So Dan, I think you've, um, my next question was going to be around sample sizes and matchups. And I think you've yeah. touched on it a little bit. Um, so matchups, I, I personally find them very interesting because, you know, that, that word gets thrown around all the time in T20 cricket, yeah. particularly. Um, and it's interesting because sometimes, you know, you could have a matchup where, you know, just, let's say just be Bumrah has gotten uh, Kohli out four times and uh, people will say, oh yeah, he's last two seasons, he's been all over Kohli when the truth might be that they might be, you know, he might be facing him in the 17th over when Kohli's just trying to get, you know, runs and, and taking all kinds of risks. So how do you uh, really work on, you know, figuring out that sample size and context sort of a problem uh, into these uh, and adding it all towards the matchup numbers so that something meaningful can be driven out of that yeah it's it's a very very complex question and i'm not actually even convinced that there's a perfect answer for this i know that himanesh and i have, have talked for a little bit about this as well um it, it's it's tough what i will say now is probably quite a controversial start to answering the question in that i actually don't look at individual batter versus bowler matchups in t20 ever when I'm doing my matchup, um, because the sample size is just too small. The t- the, there's just very little predictive value from the you know, Veracoli versus Jasper Bumrah or something like that in isolation when they're facing each other. And I think that that's a, a lot of areas where people struggle to understand that. They, they really will think that a 40 ball sample size between the batsman and the bowler is meaningful and they can draw meaningful conclusions. But actually, I prefer, say, to find... Coley versus players who are like Jasper Brumra, and then building a bigger sample size of that. So if you could find, say, I don't know, 20, 30 players who are like Jasper Brumra, and then you can group the 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 um, sample size together, then suddenly you've got a more robust sample size. When you shouldn't lose very much in accuracy either. It should be it should be a pretty accurate sample size. And also you can look at population tendencies as well. So I think most people who follow cricket to, to a half decent degree will know that, for example, um, a, a right-handed batsman is is should should bat well against a, a right-arm off spin. You know, it's a good matchup for the batsman as opposed to the bowler. So you can look at how those players as a group played against right arm off spinners as well and look at that general population tendency as well and sometimes you do find players who deviate from that a little bit uh, for example some right handers who are who are pretty uh, you know 360 degree players uh, uh, can perform better against leg spin and slow left arm than than is conventional for, for a right-handed batsman but but on the whole you can draw a lot of, uh, of value from the a group's population tendency as well so i kind of when i'm doing it i mix right. in the population tendencies generally plus a subset of players against 
certain batsmen and bowlers and then phase data as well so it's a lot of factors all push, kind of pushed together to get a bit more predictive value and to get a more of a robust sample size but i do accept that it's it's almost an imperfect science i think that it's it's very very difficult to to have like a game theory optimal strategy for matchups and i, and I actually think that you could argue that will probably never come right yeah it, it almost seems like it's bowler type that you look at worse rather than um, yeah. you know specific matchups which which makes sense yeah. um but i will say if there's 15 to 20 just beat broom runs around the world then the batsmen <laughs> yeah. will be in trouble yeah. <laughs> they're very one-sided contest yeah <laughs> my my next article for cricket info sort of talks about this where i've tried to measure the deviation of a particular batsman from yeah. the population's tendencies against a particular kind of bowling so yeah. relative to the matchup how do you do and I tried to make a predictive model out of that, but there's too much scatter when you compare to the actual data. And yeah. that's always a challenge, right? So I've been trying to do it, but yeah, it's always problematic. Now, uh, I'll move on to an article I did write before, which is boundary hitting, which you also retweeted, I think, uh, which was a few months ago, I think. Yeah. And I <clears throat> was looking for this binary record of attacked versus not attacked. You know, mm -hmm. balls you've attacked versus not attacked. Yeah. And I couldn't find it. And it was very, very uh, stupefying for me because this should be a basic stat in T20 cricket. So what are the more complex numbers that you want people to record in T20? Or do you think the basic yeah. numbers do well in terms of gauging players? I, I don't actually. I think that there's a lot of, of work that cricket can do to really improve in that area. So you, you mentioned about attacks versus non-attacks to start with. And I think that that's, it's just too vague to understand as well because... Uh, a player, a player's shot might be perceived to be attacked by one person, but not attacked by another person. So no. I would argue that anyone purposely knocking a ball into a gap for a single is actually not attacking it. But a lot of people would say right. they're attacking because they're not playing a forward defensive. So it's very vague, and I don't. I, I think that it's quite subjective, and I think that's something that I would try and avoid in terms of statistical analysis generally. That that vague subjective. Uh, uh, decisions are not good. Um, what, what? It's funny because obviously, Quick Info, are one of the biggest websites for for cricket data, cricket scorecards, etc. But I, I would love to see a lot more in in the Quick Info scorecards on a on a regular basis. So, for example, I mean, um, when I, I remember when I first started looking at cricket data in in real detail, it blew my mind that you could get uh, maiden maiden over count for a for a bowler in T20, but you couldn't get their like percentage of yeah. boundaries conceded or like yeah. phase splits and stuff like that. So I think like that phase split, batters versus pace and spin, batters boundary percentage, batters non-boundary strike rate, batters dot ball percentage, all those kind of things, the phase splits I first say for batter and bowler as well. Uh it would just be so much more kind of it would help the casual fan to learn a lot more about players strengths and weaknesses where were the key moments in a match what what, what, what was the man of the match actually the best player or, or what or was it just because they picked up a load of cheap wickets at their death or something like that and and i think that the it would really inform casual fans to to understand the game a lot more and that and that's got to be a good thing right we want people to understand our, our great sport as much as possible so so whatever we can give someone is 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 great and i also think there's other things as well so english county cricket it's it's lumped as first class for red ball right but it's division one and division two and right. the standard's quite different so it you can look good. How you, you might average forty in your career, but if it's all in Division Two, then it, it probably doesn't mean nearly as much as if it was in Division One. So, but but it's not. It's it's all grouped together, and I think there's can be some differentiations there as well. It's probably the same as with with Indian domestic players as well. You might have players who have played ten years inside Mushtaq Ali and never in the Premier League, Indian Premier League, and they look like they've got really good numbers, but they actually haven't played at the highest level. So it's difficult to, to ascertain. And by if we're looking at like you know, individual player data, I think being able to do filters for time scales as well would be really useful as well. Because otherwise career data overvalues older declining players and undervalues young players who have improved, but they still yeah. have that too much waiting from the when they're like 19 or 20 or 21 they're just sort of first team as well so so i think there's a lot of improvements that people could make in terms of their usage of statistics and scorecards or 
on TV, in the media, everything like that, and just just really just try and inform the, the the fan as much as possible, so that they can they can understand the sport as, as well as they possibly could. From the perspective of an analyst, though, like do you do you think the numbers we currently record are like useful in terms of predicting performance or like using it to build teams, or do we need something else? Do we need things like XR and XW in the public domain or with people to make judgments? Right? Yeah. That, so this, this, the word that I can get, I, I, I just built my own metrics because I was kind of frustrated about them not being in the public. So, but then I suppose that gives you a bit of intellectual property as well. So that's, I guess, fine too. Um, so so I, I started looking at boundary percentage and, and four, six ratios and things like that, which were really good for team building because you can understand which players are better suited to specific roles. Um, yeah, stuff like expected runs, expected runs over the average player and stuff. I expect it to probably become more mainstream over the next few years mm. but i'm i'm not necessarily convinced of that the merits of that metric in isolation because a lot of it's going to be pretty contextual as well at the same time so mm. so and, and how do you measure it as well so you might let's say for the sake of argument a player a team's chasing 180 to win and and one of their batters scores 60 or 50 balls okay now we don't know, unless you watch the match and you understand the match, how the match is developing, you don't know if that's a good innings or a bad innings because we, we, we don't know whether he's trying to kind of keep the innings going for as long as possible because other people are getting out or his slow scoring has actually caused everyone else to get out because, because right, of right. they're playing catch up on the strike rate. So yeah. it's, it's got to be quite contextual I think, as well. So, yeah, I'm unconvinced about it, but I can see that becoming more mainstream. So I'm going to change the uh, topic just a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about spin. And I think when T20 started, I remember reading theories where, you know, this is going to be the end of spinners with big bats, short boundaries, and all of that. Um, obviously, that's not necessarily true. And we've seen how spin has been successful in T20s. Uh, but there's a school of thought that it's primarily because batsmen are conservative in the 7 to 14 over range. Um do you think that's that's true? Um, and how would you also break that down between wrist spinners and finger spinners? Yeah, I think that you make a really good point there in the question. And I agree with you pretty much 100% in terms of the conservative nature of a lot of batsmen in the middle overs. You certainly, I think, see that in the IPL quite a lot with someone someone like Virat Kohli would be just that, that they have that low boundary percentage in the middle overs, low low strike rate against spinners. And then they look to try and see the spinners off and, and then kind of tee off at the the sort of 16 over mark or, or, or later. And I think that's quite an IPL dynamic, actually. And, and you see it less, maybe it's because the standard's different, but you see it less in, say, the T20 blast in England. You will see players go harder in the middle overs than compared to the IPL. But then by the same token, in the IPL, the strike rate of the death is often a lot higher than what you would see in the blast. Like, you you know, in the IPL, if, you, if you're if you 14 and over and you've got quite a few wickets in hand, uh, with four overs to go, you're, you're well in the game. But but in, in the blast, I think you'd be heavy underdog to chase 50 overs, even with some wickets in hand. So there, there, there's different dynamics. I, I don't like conservative batsmen in the middle overs. And, and I I personally wouldn't prioritise them for recruitment. I, I would look to go different direction and find players with a bit more middle, middle over intent. And I do think batsmen are very conservative against spinners in the middle overs. And I think that that is a big part of it. Um, with regards to, to leg spin versus finger spin, I think that the reason why leg spin is so vogue in terms of the spin types used in, in, in T20 cricket is because the balls per dismissal against both left and right handlers is lower than what it would be for finger spin. So obviously finger spin is a, is a very kind of, you have to be very match-up centric with it as well. There's there's instances where on off spinner is is not going to even be needed if the team has, say, got six right handers in the, in, the, in the top seven. You wouldn't even really want to pick an off, uh, an off spinner. And... and and then you, you you can look at today's match in the IPL as a bit of an example of that as well, because I would argue that with Glenn Maxwell playing for RCB in the top five, his numbers against left-hand batsmen are actually really quite good and better than a lot of specialist spinners. So if you've got Glenn Maxwell in your batting team, you probably don't need Washington Sundar unless you're playing against a really left-hander heavy uh, top six. And, and so you can you can look to structure up a little bit differently as well. So with finger spinners, I think the matchups are a lot a lot more 
it's a lot more key than for, for leg spinners. And I think that that's probably uh, one difference in the dynamic between the spin. So Dan, let's switch gears and talk about tactics. One of the trending t- tactics right now is this high pace at hard lengths and it's becoming a potent weapon at pretty much every stage, right? It's almost like a go-to yeah. weapon for captains, right? So what are your views on this and what other like, you know, pretty left field strategic shifts do you see? That's uh, in the pipeline for this. Um, it's an interesting thing that you bring up about the uh, the, the sort of middle o- middle overs enforcer, if you like, I guess, with that hard pace. Uh, uh, it, it's I'm I'm convinced by it, but I haven't done a lot of research on it yet, and it's actually on my to do list to to do some more research. So, so actually, about two weeks ago on Twitter, I reached out to Twitter and asked for suggestions of of players who they think fit that role, so then I can do some research on those players to see if actually it's a viable strategy I, I instinctively i'm unconvinced i actually think that the the high pace is a little bit overrated in t20 maybe not so much in the ipl but definitely in in the blast in england which i work in is high pace is overrated in my opinion and pace off often often has a lot better economy rates you know sort of, the, sort of 75 mile an hour paces will, will often have a better economy than 90 mile an hour so in, in those middle overs so you look at someone like benny howell who, who will describe himself as being a fast spinner basically versus i don't know like liam plunkett or something like that benny howell will have much better economy and and, and he's i think he's a better middle over operator than, than someone like Liam Plunkett situation. So um, I, I need to do some more research to have a firm view on that high pace in the middle overs. But yeah, um, I'm unconvinced at the moment in terms of the merits of high pace generally. I think the higher the standard, there's probably a bit more necessity for high pace. With regards to kind of strategic shifts, I think that one area that we're going to see a lot more of is bowlers who can hit. So the, the, these players are becoming massive in, in auction. We saw that in, in the auction for the IPL recently. Chris Morris, Joy Richardson, Kyle Jamieson all went for big money. And I think that the, the big area where bowlers can upskill is their hitting. And it doesn't have to, they don't have to be a good batsman, but they need to be able to produce like a 10 off six or 11 off 11 off six or kind of thing of 13 off eight kind of innings that just with 25% boundaries or something like that. It doesn't matter. A couple of dots, a couple of boundaries is, is often that's all they need as opposed to being a conventional batsman, you know, but, but, you know, competent batsmen like someone like Adel Rashid, Shreyas Gopal, perhaps who don't have that boundary percentage in their locker, but they're still, you would say conventionally good batsmen, if that makes sense. So just specialist hitting training for bowlers. And then, if the matchups dictate, you could also look to use them as pinch hitters as well. But either way, it's it's an area that I think as bowlers can really upskill in. And whether it's let's say pinch hitting or adding a lot of depth lower down. So I think in in the PSL, Islamabad had that insane batting depth where they pretty much batted the whole way down. Someone like Hassan Ali at nine or ten, who he's a really good example of a bowler who can hit. Um, and it just enables the top six to have a free reign pretty much in terms of that attacking intent. They don't need to play, they don't need to have an anchor. When you back down to 10, you don't need to have an anchor. But, but by the same token, you don't want to compromise your bowling qualities by having all rounders. So you have to have genuine frontline bowlers who can hit. And I can see that those genuine frontline bowlers who can hit are just going to become more and more valuable in drafts and auctions. And, and teams, in theory, will pick up on that, but we'll see. Especially in the IPL, where a lot of games are very close. It's really decided by those minor contributions. You know, it's not just the big 50s and the 40s, the crucial three ball, 10 runs or five ball, 15 runs, you know, from fast bowlers, spinners, from just genuine bowlers, that that can shape the result and in turn, the long-term hopes of that particular team. So I can see mm-hmm. a lot of teams uh, kind of emphasizing on that. We, we saw that in the first game of the IPL, uh, you know, with Harshal Patel, uh, when De Villiers got out, Harshal Patel just calmly took the singles and ensured they won the game. So it, it's those small things, you know, in the in the big context of the game, it doesn't really seem like a big deal. But those are the kind of margins that will, you know, helps push the team along. And especially in RCB's case, they need every little bit help that they can get. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Every team, every team does. You can't turn down any marginal gain, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think Jafar Archer is another player that comes to mind mm. who can, you know, double up as a real solid tail ender, but who can bludgeon a few midi blows, you know. More than any other format, I just feel like in T20s, the concept of a tail ender is, d- just doesn't exist or shouldn't exist because unlike mm. test cricket or even like ODIs for that matter, in T20s, 
you need everyone to chip in with the bat. Yeah. And I yeah. think I can see why players like Kyle Jamison or Jeffrey Archer who can hit those big blows, they are so much valued, not just for their bowling skills, but for their big hitting skills as well. Yeah, definitely. And and I, I can see more of it happening because the, the counter argument to this would be that people will say, well, the number seven or the number eight doesn't really face that many balls on average. But that's not necessarily the point because you by having that safety net, you have, you enable, it's almost like they're, they're facilitators for the top six, if you like. They're, 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 that extra safety net allows a much more attacking intent. And I right. think that that's, that's a key point. And you could say Mumbai Indians. They, you, you would almost argue that Rohit Sharma is probably the most anchor orientated batsman at the top seven, which is saying something. But then they always have a little bit of a safety net, whether it's like a Cortinal at eight or a Marco Janssen today at eight. They've got that extra little bit of a safety net. Even Adam Milne can bat if he was to come in at eight or nine as well. They've got that extra safety net to give to give the likes of Sky or Ishan Kishan or, or Hardik, Hardik Pandya that ability to just go in and tee off straight away. And I think that that's really successful squad. Right. Yeah. And to that point, Dan, I think this is kind of the foundation of Owen Morgan's limited overs side, right? Like he mm -hmm. has Adil Rashid coming in at a 10, which gives the people like Jason Roy and Owen Morgan himself so much liberty to go hammer and tongs up. Yeah, so. exactly. But the problem is, is that it, it, I, I, I'm still unconvinced about England in T20 internationals. In ODIs, I don't think there's any debate that they've completely nailed the strategy. They're, 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 I don't think there's any arguments about the way they approach ODIs at all. But I still think in T20s, they're at least one, if not two, bowlers light. And and they've probably taken that approach a little bit too far because it's 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 going to be difficult to win a tournament when you're consistently conceding like 18 to 20% boundaries in a match. And that, that, that's, a, that's a big hurdle to overcome for a batting group on a consistent basis. So I think that they've probably gone a little bit too extreme with it because they've compromised on the bowling quality. So I think earlier when I said you want to find the frontline bowlers who can do it, whereas I think that with someone like you know, Tom Curran, for example, you could even perhaps argue Chris Jordan too, the, the it's not necessarily a given that they're going to go for under 40 in the four over quota. And I think that all the time you expect them to go for more than that. So whether they're kind of that top level bowler, they're compromising on that to try and get the extra depth. Whereas in an ideal world, you'd build a squad where you could have both, both in terms of the quality frontline bowlers and have that hitting depth. Well, that's it for this episode of The Last Wicket. Tune in next week for the second part of our conversation with Dan. You can find him on Twitter at SA Advantage and his website at sportsanalyticsadvantage.com. Meanwhile, do rate and subscribe to this podcast to be notified of new episodes. Follow us on your social media feeds and do leave us a voice message if you would like to be featured on the show. Once again, thank you for listening and we hope you come back for more. From all of us here at The Last Wicket, have a great week. Thank mm -hmm. you.